guys. Any questions from last time? You guys are all cardio experts. I heard the sim went relatively well. <laughs> Everyone survived. Huh? You were the best class yet? I bet. I can imagine. I could feel it right all the way in Denver. I was like, yeah, I know these guys are doing well. They're not not going to kill anybody. Anyway, um, that's okay. It's a good good feeling to do it when it's just on a sim patient and on a real patient because then you feel really bad about it afterwards and it's no good. So, anywho. <laughs> So we're going to uh, finish up CHF, and then we'll start to talk about antiarrhythmics a little bit, which probably would have been useful last week, but that's okay. It's just the uh, nature of the beast here. Um, so anyway, so aldosterone antagonists for treatment of CHF. So what are our two aldosterone antagonists we can use? Spironolactone and a pluralinone. Yeah, those are two big ones. You remember like a particular side effect you see with spironolactone? Right, why do you see that? It's a partial androgen uh, agonist, right? So it's a partial testosterone receptor agonist, essentially. So it only kind of gives you that, that partial effect. So that's where you can kind of see the kind of estrogen efficacy, I guess. I don't know if that's a word or not. Uh, but for, for those male patients, right? Also, alternatively, in females, what could you see? Here's system, right? So they have a relatively low amount of testosterone activity. If you kind of increase that by giving a partial agonist, you can end up seeing things like that. Um, so anyway, so in, in what does this do to your potassium? You block aldosterone in the in the uh, collecting ducts. See hyperkalemia. So you see increases in potassium. That's really important because again, when you have patients who have CHF, maybe that poor kidneys, they are prone to have increased potassiums anyway. You know, also what do ACE inhibitors do to your potassium? They increase them as well. We know that these patients should probably be on the ACE inhibitor as well. So again, gotta keep an eye on this potassium here. And so um, what we see with uh, spironolactone is that um, you do have some mortality benefits, but it's really only been shown to be beneficial in more kind of later stage CHF. So once you have kind of more left ventricular dysfunction, grade three or four, essentially, that's when you're gonna see the most benefit out of this. And so we, we would recommend this unless they already have a high potassium to begin with, if it's already greater than five, or if they have a high serum creatinine. Okay, so once serum creatinine, you know, evidence of renal dysfunction, you know, that would also be a contraindication here. Um, and then we mentioned the gynecomastia being an issue here. You can always reduce the dose, potentially, that might help, help to prevent that. Otherwise, you can use a pluralinone, which tends to be more expensive, but um, lacks those kind of androgen uh, or anti-androgen sort of side effects there. Now, um, not full of the or sure of the full mechanism here, but a lot of it things has to do with this neurohormonal inhibition uh, helps to slow some of that remodeling of the, the left ventricle. So it's down a little bit. Again, doesn't reverse anything, but helps to prevent hopefully that some of that progression. Okay. Other things. So what would you do for a patient who, you know, they're coming in for like a CHF exacerbation, they're coming in, they're very hypertensive, the left ventricle just isn't really pumping that well, and they're kind of not perfusing uh, the body quite so well. Um, there's a couple of drugs we can use for that. And we call these um, inotropic agents, these are going to be positive inotropes, and these are going to be including our milrinone uh, and another drug called enamrinone. And so what these actually do are going to be uh, phosphodesterase inhibitors. And we have talked about phosphodesterase inhibitors before. Do you guys remember where we mentioned those? This is erectile dysfunction meds we mentioned, like Viagra, right? How that works in the lungs. That actually works on phosphodesterase five, um, which is going to be, you know, predominantly seen like uh, in the reproductive organs and also in the lungs. This is actually affecting PDE three. PDE three is going to be more important in the vasculature. Notice there is a little bit of bleed over there. That's why you can see, you know, the Viagra can cause hypotension if you use it with what type of drug? A nitrate, right? That's why you don't want to mix those up. Basically, what these do is they help to um, basically prevent breakdown of cyclic AMP. That helps the heart to be harder, and it also helps to lower blood pressure a little bit, which is good if you have a patient who's decompensated, they're hypertensive, but their left ventricular ejection fraction is not very good, right? So again, looking at your patients, determining, you know, what is their uh, blood pressure doing? You know, what's their heart rate doing? What's the, the left ventricle performing at? Um, can guide you as to choosing what type of therapy you want to use. So for instance, I heard uh, back on your, your sim that you were doing, the patient was, was hypotensive, correct? Is that the case? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so some of them were hypotensive. This probably wouldn't be a very good drug for that because it could actually lower your blood pressure even worse, which would not be great. Um, in other cases, you can utilize other drugs that are going to have kind of positive inotropic effects. We'll talk about those probably in another section of the class, but things like dopamine can be really good for that. Like dopamine, we know, is going to have you know good inotropic effects on the heart. It also acts as a vasopressor. When I say vasopressor, what does that mean? Increases blood pressure, right? Because it's going to help the vasoconstrict, right? So again, you're going to, uh, based on your patient, be able to decide which kind of med to use based on cardiovascular status and, and several different features there. 
So mentioned it's inotropic as well as having those vasodilatory actions so that way they can directly stimulate the myocardial uh, or the myocardium because you want cyclic AMP. It's going to help to be um, kind of pro-inotropic. So that's going to be very useful there. It helps to, to balance out this dilation of both the arteries and, and the, on the venous side. So it will decrease afterload and help to increase cardiac output, which is when you have a decompensated CHF patient like that, that's usually what their issue is, is their, their cardiac output. Um, we will use this for kind of short-term use. Um, if a patient is, say, coming into the ER, they're in the ICU, they're having an acute decompensation, we'll utilize that. And these are typically IV medications we're going to give uh, as a continuous infusion. This is either milrinone is probably the more common one I've seen. Um, but we don't like to use it long-term because there's actually been some issues with, with mortality we've seen there. So we don't like to use it long-term. Um, also, yeah, some risk for ventricular arrhythmias. Imagine, you know, if you have a heart that's already kind of Kind of poorly functioning, like the left, left ventricles, kind of, um, you know, maybe some scar tissue after an MI, or maybe it's just not very, um, it's very hypertrophied. You're kind of already at risk for more arrhythmias anyway, right? Kind of. Yes, all of that. So if I'm giving something that's going to be kind of pro-inotropic, try to help the heart to beat even harder, that can sometimes lead uh, change electrophysiology to make it more likely to see arrhythmia. So that is one risk you want to watch out for with these patients when you when you give them these medications. Um, mentioned dobutamine. This is nice because this is actually a very selective beta-1 agonist. So this will work specifically on the heart to help increase cardiac output. It really doesn't have any effect on blood pressure necessarily. Um, and again, this would be another one where you'd use it for an acute exacerbation, use it as an IV drip that we'd administer to them to help get the inotropy up, specifically by ending the beta-1 receptors. And then dopamine, I mentioned, it's kind of a more balanced effect where you'll get some uh, beta effects on the heart, but you'll also get some uh, uh, nice uh, alpha construction as well, depending on the dose that we actually give. We'll mention this later when we talk about other uh, vasopressors, but this can be a very useful one um, to help increase cardiac output for these CHF patients. Can that make sense? Because again, dopamine, you think it would hit what type of receptors? dopamine receptors, right? Because we have those in, uh, certainly in the in the brain, um, but because we see several medications, we get to the psych section that will affect that. Um, but typically dopamine itself does not uh, does not have a good time crossing the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and so you get these kind of peripheral effects where you can have increase in, in cardiac uh, output due to beta-1 effects, but can also have that constriction as you increase the dose on those alpha receptors. Okay, so any questions on CHF? So what meds are you going to give to a CHF patient? A diuretic, what's a diuretic going to help me to do? Good, so is that going to be an all the time med? Sometimes med? For some patients, it will be an all the time med just because if they have kind of this chronic edema that occurs, but yeah, generally, and does it help with mortality? No, just for symptomatic management. Good, so you might have like a Lasix prescription that you use for those patients kind of as needed. What else? A beta blocker? What's a beta blocker going to help us to do? Yeah, so which beta blockers? There's three of them we mentioned. Metoprolol, XL, that was actually the, specifically the XL formulation. What else? Carvedilol and the Soprolol is the other one. Yeah, so those are the three main ones. But, you know, and why is that counterintuitive to give a beta blocker to a patient? Because we just saw if you have a decompensation, we're giving them a beta-1 agonist. Why would we give them a beta blocker? It's for more chronic use. It's more chronic use, right? You got to start very low dose and gently titrate it up. You know, ideally, if they're inpatient, that's going to be the safest way to do it. So that way you can actually monitor if they end up crumping on you, right? And then you go to the ICU or something. Um, so utilize low doses, gently titrate it. There is mortality benefits to using one of those three beta blockers, right? So that's good. Any other drugs they should be on? Some sort of ACE inhibitor, right? Because that's going to help with what? Yeah, it's going to be helping with LV uh, remodeling. It's going to help to decrease that. It helps with, uh, you know, help with the blood pressure as well. A lot of these patients are going to be hypertensive, and you know, get mortality benefits out of that. Okay, what else? Dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. How would that be useful for our CHF patients? Okay, good. Yeah, so if they're still hypertensive, so if they're on a beta blocker, they're on an ACE inhibitor, um, and they are still hypertensive, that could be an option, right? You wouldn't want to use a non-dihydropyridine. No, why? Yeah, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna hit our cardiac output. We don't want to do that. And we'll see the same benefits like we do with some of those beta blockers. Okay, what other drugs could they be on? Digoxin. Okay, how's that gonna be useful? Okay, so it's gonna help with some of that. Is that providing mortality benefits? Just symptomatic management, right? So if they're kind of topped off on their beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, the direct working pretty well. If they're still symptomatic. Sometimes digoxin can be useful. Who else could benefit from digoxin? AFib, yeah, so we'll talk about that in the um, in the antiarrhythmic section coming up next. AFib is the other kind of thing where digoxin can be useful to help treat that arrhythmia. Any other meds they should be on? 
what can help to prevent, say, like plaque formation? And aspirin. So aspirin could be a good one, right? So they should, probably should be on aspirin. What else? Statins, yeah, statins are kind of the other big big thing there, right? So statins can help to kind of prevent uh, progression of disease. They can help to prevent uh, mortality, hopefully, uh, in the long run. Okay, good. So keep in mind, you know, what meds patients should be on. If they're diabetic, what should they definitely be on? ACE, ACE inhibitor, right? Or an ARB could be a good alternative as well because it's going to be what? Renal protective. protective, absolutely. Fantastic. Good. So again, looking at your patient, look at their comorbidities. It will help you decide which meds they need to be on um, and, and can also give you a key and into what kind of side effects they might be experiencing, you know, things like that. So keep all that stuff in mind. Okay. All right. Moving on. Let's talk about You guys know what the objectives are. All right. Cardiac muscle. Have you guys covered antiarrhythmics? At all, besides, you're talking about a little bit in EKG, correct? A little bit. Okay, we're going to go more into depth. You guys know the, the classification for the antiarrhythmics, how we classify them? You guys ever heard of Vaughn Williams classification? Yeah, yeah so th this is what we're going to be mentioning here the Vaughn Williams classification. <laughs> what? Is that? Oh, is he? Okay, interesting. All right. Um, anyway, he I don't think he was the one that was involved with it. Otherwise, he's very, very talented if he was. Um, probably very old as well, I would imagine. But anyway, so this is the way we're going to classify these uh, antiarrhythmics. So anyway, so cardiac muscle, we know, and we, we covered this in physio before, so I guys know you're gonna up to speed on a lot of this, but the stride to muscle, notice that automaticity, where's the primary amount of automaticity coming from? The SA node and the AV node, fantastic. Um, and again, it's one of those things where it's kind of an all and none phenomenon. We'll see that some of the cells are gonna be kind of those leaky sodium cells that are gonna be responsible for those kind of pacemaker kind of action. And then a lot of the other cells, really they don't have action potentials on their own unless they have some sort of signal coming in that says, hey, you should trigger off an action potential, right? So we'll kind of review that. And it helps that we have this functional syncytium, right? We have all these nice intercalated discs here that help for movement of electrolytes along the, the myocardiums that we have a nice functional uh, uh, squeeze on the heart that's gonna allow us to effectively pump blood out and bring more blood in. So again, looking at these uh, specialized cardiac cells, you have the SA node, AV node, as we mentioned, and even if you were to obliterate both of those nodes, we still have some degree of automaticity, but typically the rate goes down as you get to these kind of further, um, uh, you know, kind of further down along the pathway here. So even like the bundle of his and the Purkinje fibers can still have some degree of automaticity. It's usually pretty slow that the patients will, will still be pretty bradycardic for the most part. Now, you know, looking at the action potential, we'll see here that the SA node is going to be one of those, uh, has automaticity to it. It's going to be those leaky sort of uh, uh, channels we'll see there, leaky sodium channels that are going to be able to action, uh, generate an action potential on its own. Um, we'll see that atrial muscle cannot do that generally, uh, which is good because we want that to wait for a signal from the SA node to really fire off. And then we'll see the AV node will also have some degree of automaticity, but it won't be as fast as the SA node, right? So otherwise, if the uh, AV node is faster than the SA node, then that would be setting the, the rate for the heart. And you don't want that. You kind of want it to be from the top down, essentially. Um, then you're going to go through the different sections of the heart here. Notice these are all going to be, um, you know, again, not really having much automaticity to it, if any at all, but really your, your ventricular muscle um, should be kind of subservient to those, those pacemaker cells. And so again, we get our typical EKG sort of pattern here. So um, looking at the different phases here, so looking at our fast response cells, this is just typical cardiac muscle cells, um, you know, nothing with automaticity here. You're going to notice there's several phases, right? Um, so what's kind of happening at this point right here? What triggers off a phase zero? Hmm? So what, what is the trigger to uh, start phase zero, though? Because it doesn't happen on its own, right? It needs some sort of action potential to come along, right? So generally from like the SA node or the AV node, like that's gonna be the thing that will incite uh, this to occur, right? Because we know that the, the sodium channels can, um, you know, due to that functional sensation, due to those intercalated discs, we can transfer ions pretty easily. And this is gonna be useful to help us to trigger off that phase zero, which as you mentioned, is gonna be rapid sodium influx, okay? The reason why we cover this again, uh, why do you think this is important? This is exactly how the medications are going to be affecting this, right? So they're going to find the different medications, and this is how we classify them is based on what type of channels are going to hit um, and which type of uh, effects we're going to have on the EKG, essentially, right? So we're going to see the sodium channels are going to be the big influx here. Um, then you're going to have uh, this kind of little plateau phase that's occurring here. So phase one into two, what's kind of happening here? So phase one, potassium usually is going to be in a higher or lower concentration inside the cell. Inside the cardiac. Usually it's in a higher concentration, right? So again, think about your uh, your cells as typically being salt wrapped bananas, right? So potassium's on the inside, salt's generally gonna be a higher concentration on the outside. And that seems like an odd analogy, but um, I imagine it might be kind of tasty, sound sweet and salty a little bit. Anyway, um, 
So looking at this, you're going to have uh, potassium flowing outwards, right? So that's along its concentration gradient. You're going to have some inward flow of uh, chloride. So it's going to help give you that little dip there during phase one. Phase two is primarily going to be these inward calcium uh, currents, right? Because usually in this, uh, the myocyte, where's a lot of the calcium being stored? that sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? All the stuff in physio comes right back. It's weird. Um, but anyway, so you open up that sarcoplasmic reticulum that has a lot of uh, calcium already in there. So generally when that's being sequestered, if you open up those calcium channels, as happens during this uh, phase two, you're going to have uh, basically calcium flowing along this concentration gradient going into the cell, essentially. And that's what's going to help keep this kind of more positive for the most part. Uh, eventually those will end up closing off and then you're going to have this phase three, this outward potassium current, right? And so this is going to, again, allow potassium to flow out of the cell. It's going to help to bring the action potential uh, kind of close it out and we'll bring, bring that uh, the electric potential back down to the resting membrane potential essentially right and again this is typically between like say negative 70 to negative 90 or so typically where that's gonna be resting at so potassium flowing out and again this will be important because what would happen if I say blocked potassium right here say I block those channels up I plugged them up with a drug or something else it will slow the ability to repolarize which um, interval on the EKG do you think that would affect QT, absolutely. So when we see QT prolongation, a lot of the times it's due to drugs or something else blocking these potassium channels, right? Or you have a mutation in it, you have a, a congenital prolonged QT or something like that. So potassium is going to be very, very important here. And then obviously what helps to maintain that uh, resting membrane potential is going to be our sodium potassium ATPase pump, right? So it's going to be pumping sodium in or out of the cell out of the cell against the concentration gradient and potassium into the cell where it has, again, against a concentration gradient because it obviously requires ATP in order to help make that, that function, right? Okay, so if you were to look at this, uh, again, looking at the ion concentrations that are occurring during phase zero, you end up having a kind of rapid influx of sodium. This is just another uh, kind of way to, to illustrate this. Um, during that phase one, you're going to have some potassium flowing out of the cell, a little bit of chloride coming in, and then primarily that plateau phase is going to be mainly due to calcium, right? Because calcium comes in, and then what does calcium do within it when it's in the myocyte? opens up the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? It's that calcium-induced calcium release, essentially. So calcium comes into the cell, will trigger that sarcoplasmic reticulum to open up all that calcium, and then what happens? Contraction occurs, right? That's what's going to trigger off that um, the actin and the mycin to bind up together, and they're going to cause a contraction to happen there, okay? So calcium is really important for that. Calcium will be helping with the strength of the squeeze of the heart, so the more calcium coming in, the stronger the squeeze of the heart's going to be. And we saw that when we talked about digoxin, which we'll cover again a little bit later. After that, then potassium is going to be flowing out. This is going to help us to get back to our resting membrane potential. And then you also have that sodium potassium ATP is pump helping to keep things set at the normal resting membrane uh, point. Just another way we can kind of look at this. Again, remember those calcium channels are really important here. We mentioned that if I were to have a non dihydropyridine like verapamil come along, what does that do to the squeeze of the heart? decreases that, right? That's why we didn't want to use it for our CHF patients typically, because it's going to be a cardiodepressant. It's going to help to decrease that squeeze of the heart and prevent us from uh, uh, you know, having a good ejection fraction, a good cardiac output, essentially. So again, those, those uh, T-type calcium channels we mentioned, I'm sorry, the L-type calcium channels we, we mentioned uh, is going to be the primary mover and shaker for, for those drugs. Um, but again, this is just a good uh, example of showing you the different channels, how they're kind of functioning. And again, potassium is going to be super, super important here for helping us to reset the heart to help us get back to that resting membrane potential. If that doesn't happen, then, then we can see some issues there. Okay. So what about what's a refractory period? Yeah, so basically uh, it's going to be that no matter how strong of a signal comes along, it cannot trigger a new action potential, right? We call that what type of refractory period? Absolute, right? So the absolute refractory period means you, no matter how strong the signal is, it's not going to cause a, a new action potential. But you do have a period where you have the relative refractory period, and that means... Yeah, if you have a strong enough signal, that can trigger a new action potential. Why is that a problem? That's when you can develop arrhythmias, right? So we had the issues where if you have areas of the heart which have been, um, you know, deadened, if they turn, you know, they have areas of ischemia where you've damaged that tissue, uh, does it conduct like normal, healthy myocytes? No, it's usually typically a little bit slower, right? So you can end up finding issues where you have different areas of the heart that are not conducting appropriately. You can have these kind of range and arrhythmias that come along and trigger off a, a, an action potential during that relative refractory period. And that's when you can run into seeing arrhythmias, right? So that's one of the issues you see, you know, why patients can go into like V-fib after a massive MI is due to the issues of, of these kind of uh, heart cells not really conducting appropriately and you see these arrhythmias develop. Kind of make sense? 
So anyway, so that's really important, and we can find uh, that different uh, antiarrhythmics will have the ability to uh, extend uh, either the relative refractory period or the absolute refractory period, depending on how it's kind of affecting the cell. So looking at the slow response cells of these SA and AV nodes, obviously these are going to be uh, dependent on these kind of leaky sodium channels. We're always going to have a little bit of sodium flowing in. The sodium potassium pump is always going to be working essentially, but you have a little bit more sodium coming in to kind of can kind of overcome that. And then once you hit that uh, resting that that uh, threshold point, that's when you have the actual potential occur. Obviously, here it's going to be more focused on inward calcium current. So again, this is again where you see the the uh, non dihydropyridines uh, can have effect on automaticity of the heart and slow down heart rate. Uh, next, you're going to find that they'll have calcium uh, coming in here, but you're going to have this counterbalance on phase two uh, potassium output. And then coming out on phase three is mainly going to be potassium. And then finally, sodium potassium ATPase pump is going to really help us to uh, get back to that resting membrane potential. Okay. Make sense? You guys seem so excited after your, uh, your, your potluck. I expected you guys would be a little bit more bubbly, excited. You're wearing costumes. They all look silly. Nothing? No? Okay. That homework assignment must have really just threw you guys for a loop. It's okay. So anyway. Um, so again, looking here at phase zero, mainly going to be calcium influx. It's going to help to trigger that off. Um, next, you'll find potassium efflux will help to get that uh, negativity or that electro uh, electro potential back down close to a resting membrane potential. And then finally, it's just a sodium potassium pump that's going to help to kind of reset that, get it back to the beginning, and then those leaky sodium channels will take back over to eventually develop another actual potential. Okay. So we can see that we can have, uh, you know, several effects on changing the automaticity of these cells based on things like, um, you know, the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So imagine um, if I were to have, say, um, you know, a uh, fight or flight response that occurs, say a bear popped out, someone spooked you, gave you a nasty trick on Halloween, right? Um, and all of a sudden your heart rate is going to go. Right, so again, your fight or flight response, you're going to have a lot of epinephrine, norepinephrine being released. You're going to have it affect the heart. Tachycardia is going to develop. Why does that occur? Well, you can see that this can actually happen by uh, by affecting things like potassium conductance. Right. So if I were to decrease potassium conductance, meaning I'm having less potassium leave the cell, what do you think that does to that resting membrane potential? I have more positives on the inside now, so that should. <clears throat> elevate it, right? So my, my electric potential is now going up on the inside of the cell. And that, now what does that mean for that, that electric potential? Am I closer or farther away now? Because I was starting down here and I've kind of brought it up to here. That means I'm much closer to having a new action potential. So now the sodium channels have to work, uh, work for a shorter period of time to get to that potential point and then it has an action potential. That kind of makes sense? So again, by affecting things like potassium conductance, you can see how it can have a direct effect on how fast the heart's going to be able to generate these action potentials. Okay. Similarly, if we were to, or I guess on the flip side of that, if you were to look at the cholinergic effects, right? So I have the parasympathetic effects here. So say after you eat a big, nice potluck lunch, I'm um, going to have your parasympathetic uh, nervous system take over. You have a lot of acetylcholine affecting those cholinergic muscarinic receptors in the heart. Typically, that's what it does what to your heart rate. So is it down, right? So you can see bradycardia after you have cholinergic effects here. That will actually increase potassium conductance by letting more potassium out. That's going to make the potential of the cell more negative, make it more difficult to reach that, that threshold. Okay. So again, you can see how things like, you know, atropine. You guys have heard of the drug atropine before? Right? What does atropine do? It's an anti-muscarinic, right? So it actually will do the opposite effect of here and will act more like an uh, adrenergic drug, right? So that's why you can see that when you have a patient who's bradycardic, by giving them an anti-muscarinic, all of a sudden that's going to help to decrease that potassium conductance and allow the heart to beat faster, right? So that's why it's typically one of the big effects you're going to see with atropine. That's why I give it for symptomatic bradycardia because it brings the heart rate back up, okay? Similarly, if I were to give epinephrine to somebody, you'd imagine they would also get very tachycardic as well because, again, I'm giving them something that will directly affect those, uh, those um the automaticity of those cells. Okay, so looking at the mechanisms for arrhythmia, I'm sure you covered this a little bit already, but we can see there's some issues here with either um, abnormal impulse formation. So if we would have, say, like altered automaticity, like sometimes people will have uh, ectopic pacemakers that can be generating uh, potential that will override things like the SA or the AV node. Um, sometimes you can have these kind of early after depolarizations that can again trigger off. Uh, if something were to, to fire too quickly, that could trigger off an arrhythmia. And then sometimes it'll be due to uh, impulse conduction. So either do those re arrhythmias like I, like I kind of mentioned, when you have areas of ischemia potentially, or if you have some kind of unidirectional block that helps to prevent um, the action potential from being transmitted appropriately. So those are kind of the different ways that we can see this uh, with these and certainly you can find all kinds of different arrhythmias that can develop from this. I'm no EKG reading expert. Certainly I can see PEA. That's pretty, pretty easy. Uh, VFib, 
little squiggly line, not good. Um, and there's a couple tox things that I'm a little bit better versed at, at reading here. Um, which one of these is particularly drug related? Yeah, torsades is a big one, right? So that's due to that potassium uh, uh, rectifier pump being blocked, right? So you end up having kind of a delayed uh, uh, resetting of those those ventricular cells, and so where you can see this kind of kind of a very odd sort of arrhythmia. You know why it's called torsades to points? Yeah, well, it's French for for twisting with the points. You can kind of see here how it kind of uh, kind of flips around on itself a little bit there. So that's what kind of where they get that from. But anyway, um, so we're going to be looking at um, different types of arrhythmias. We'll see that different drugs are going to be able to affect this differently, right? So something that works on automaticity is going to be better for what type of arrhythmias. So say I have like a really fast signal, say from the atria transmitting down to the ventricles, causing me very very tachycardic. Certain drugs are going to be better if they're going to be able to affect the automaticity of those SA and AV node, or they're going to be able to affect that conduction through those cells, right? So we're going to see that certain things are going to be better for atrial type of arrhythmias, certain things are going to be better for treating ventricular sort of arrhythmias. And so it'll be important to kind of be able to delineate between those two. So that way, if you have a patient who has SVT, I'm not going to give them something that's going to potentially kill them, right? Or if they have uh, VFib, I'm not going to give them something that's going to be completely ineffective. And so this is why it's important to kind of get an idea now of which drugs are going to be best for what sort of arrhythmias, right? So I'm not going to get uh, probably as in-depth as you could if you were to talk to a cardiologist or an electrophysiologist or somebody, but we'll at least get the basics down here, okay? But it's important to note the drugs, what kind of effects they're going to have, and then uh, side effects as well for a lot of these. Because some of these patients will be on these antiarrhythmics for a long time, for their several years, and they're going to see there's some, some chronic issues with these. So principally, we want to identify and remove any kind of precipitating factors that are leading the patient to have an arrhythmia in the first place, right? So if they're hypoxic, you want to? Give them oxygen. Obviously, they're they're you know their myocardium is getting ischemic, and that's why you're developing rhythm. You should probably give them some oxygen, right? Um, if they're having an electrolyte issue, give them electrolytes or take away electrolytes potentially, right? So maybe sometimes, especially like hyperkalemia, you can see arrhythmia is developed from that too, right? So there's some issues on either side. You don't want to you want to hit that kind of that Goldilocks spot where you're right in the sweet spot. You don't want to have too much or too little of anything because you can see issues developed there, right? Um, so we want to establish our goals of therapy. In some cases, for more chronic arrhythmias, um, is it feasible to fix the arrhythmia or should we just focus on maybe just slowing down the rate of it? You guys heard like rhythm control versus rate control? That'll come up, right? So in some cases, you don't actually fix the arrhythmia itself. Like the heart's still beating kind of funny, but we can at least fix the rate of it to make it so that the ventricles can still work appropriately and patients still oxygenating like they should be, all of that stuff. So we're, we're going to look at that as well. Do want to um, see that, uh, you know, in some of these cases, we can't fix some of the issues, especially if it's a more of a structural issue. Uh, some cases it requires surgery. Some, you know, sometimes it'll be more um, kind of idiopathic where it just kind of comes and goes uh, potentially uh, for certain patients. So the, the goals will be different for everyone essentially. And so then the other big things we'll see is that just like when we talk about chemo drugs, every chemo drug can cause cancer, unfortunately. We're going to see that any antiarrhythmic drug could also cause an arrhythmia, right? So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. This is why um, some of these drugs can be very, very dangerous if put in the wrong hands. You want to be very, very careful when you're using them. Um, and again, electrophysiology, the heart really is just a moving target. So you can find that um, where there's areas of ischemia that can affect that resting membrane potential, and this is where we see a lot of issues pop up here, uh, conduction velocity will change, the amount of calcium that's available in the, in the cell, all of this can be affecting basically where the arrhythmia is happening, why it's happening, and so you need to be able to kind of uh, isolate those issues in order to make sure we're treating it effectively. Okay, so how we classify these antiarrhythmic drugs, it'll be based on things like, you know, do they block sodium channels? We're going to see if you were to block sodium channels, what do you think that would do to, say, those auto, uh, the automaticity of something like the SA node and the AV node? Probably slow it down a little bit, right? So we're going to see some things will help to prevent uh, uh, excitability. Uh, we're going to look at some things will help to prolong the action potential, right? So we're going to see things that block potassium channel will be really important there. Um, you can do things like beta blockade, right? So if we were to block the beta 1 receptors, you can see issues where you can actually slow down the AV nodal conduction. You can slow down the heart rate, which can be very useful for things like what type of arrhythmias do you think that would be good for? Well, yeah, so they have a tachyarrhythmia, certainly, but think about like atrial arrhythmias, right? Like usually atrial arrhythmias, they have to, in order to transmit those signals down to the ventricles, it has to go through that kind of common pathway, right? So the SA AV node sort of pathway there. If it can't get through that, if you're slowing it down, that can be very useful to treat those kind of atrial arrhythmias. So I'm going to try to point these things out so at least um, pharmacologically, it makes a little bit more sense of why we're using certain drugs for certain arrhythmias. You're going to find that some of them are going to be very kind of uh, broad spectrum, so to speak, and they can treat uh, uh, various types of arrhythmias. Um, you'll kind of notice that if you were like working in the ER, if you kind of give them one drug and that doesn't work, give them another drug that doesn't work, you always fall back to what? Antiarrhythmic? You guys probably used it a couple times in your CHF case. Starts with an A. 
amiodarone, right? Amiodarone is one of those ones like, I don't know, nothing else is working, let's try amio, right? Um, which we'll see some issues with that as well due to side effects and whatnot. But amio is kind of one of those fallback where it's like, I don't know what's going to fix it, but amio might work, so let's try it. Anyway, calcium channel blockers will also be uh, used as well. So we're going to see these fall into different categories as we go through. Okay, so the classification, we're going to see here that the class one are going to be sodium channel blockers. And those are going to be broken down into three subcategories, class 1A, 1B, and 1C. The difference here is how they affect those sodium channels. Some of them are going to be affecting them in the open state. Some will be affecting them in the inactivated state. So we're going to look at this and see like how long they bind to the, the channel. That will be affecting how to, uh, we'll show how it will affect the EKG. We'll see that in just a few minutes. Um, class 2 are going to be our beta blockers. Really, any beta blocker can be considered a class 2 antiarrhythmic because, again, it's going to have the same effects on the heart based on the effects on the beta 1 receptor, right? Class 3 is going to be the ones that help to prolong potassium uh, and help to uh, block repolarization. For that in a little bit. Class 4 is going to be calcium channel blockers, and then we're going to have kind of an others, like a miscellaneous category. We'll include things like adenosine and digitalis or digoxin, uh, just another name for that. Um, anyone know what we use adenosine for? SVT. That's kind of our go-to uh, drug we can start off with for, for uh, SVT. Okay, so you don't have to know all these indications here, but we're going to kind of go through and we'll talk about um, which type of arrhythmias these are all going to be good for. But if you notice, we mentioned the class 2 antiarrhythmics, which just said are what? Yeah, those are beta blockers, right? So notice what kind of arrhythmias they're good for. Superventricular tachycardia, which means it's originating where? Above the ventricles, right? You know, fibrilla atrial fibrillation, I shouldn't actually put there. Um, this is not going to be great for vent uh, ventricular arrhythmias, right? Because, again, the issue is not with the uh, a lot of the like, ventricular arrhythmias that develop, especially after, like, an MI or something like that. A lot of it has to do with issues in the actual ventricles. Beta blockers aren't really going to help with that because it's more affecting the SA and the AV node primarily. Um, similarly, if you're looking for things like calcium channel blockers, they're not going to really help with a ventricular or originating arrhythmia, right? It can help with things that are happening above in the, uh, you know, in the atria, but it really doesn't help with those ventricular ones particularly well. However, we're going to see with um, the class uh, threes here, those are going to be kind of broad spectrum. They can certainly affect ventricular arrhythmias. Sometimes you can use it for uh, things like AFib even, you know, so it can kind of work everywhere in the heart. And similarly, you can see this as well with uh, the class uh, 1A, 1B, and 1C drugs, right? So again, affecting sodium channels, affecting potassium channels, that can be useful for uh, atrial or, or ventricular arrhythmias typically, okay? Everyone with me so far? Okay. All right. So anyway, so the sodium channel kind of has three basic states here. So we're going to see that it has kind of the resting state where typically sodium is not going to be coming in here, right? Um, unless it has some sort of action potential coming along to open it up, it's going to stay pretty much uh, closed here. These are not the same leaky sodium channels we saw with the, the SA node and the AV node. This is primarily going to be as kind of uh, the slow response cells, we, or I'm sorry, the, the fast response cells we mentioned earlier. So normally sodium will be blocked from coming in. No problems here, right? So sometimes you can have... Um, drugs that will come in and block the, the channel in this confirmation. When it's in a, or activated, I should say, this is going to open up and allow uh, sodium to flow in. Some drugs will affect here in the open state. And then afterwards, you're going to have that, during that refractory period, you're going to have this inactivated state, um, which can be affected by some drugs as well. So again, even though the channel looks like it's still open, there's another uh, portion of it that's kind of closing it off. And that's important to have this kind of refractory period, because that will allow the cell to reset itself, essentially, and get ready for a new action potential to come along. Okay. So... Looking at the class 1A, this is going to be helping to slow phase zero. So this helps slow conduction. Uh, and again, that can help with both uh, either atrial arrhythmias or ventricular arrhythmias, kind of slow things all the way through that uh, conduction cycle. And it'll help to prolong the action potential. So you can see here, by blocking the sodium channels, notice the peak doesn't get nearly as high because some of the sodium channels are being blocked. And it kind of slows things down for the most part. Okay, These typically have a little bit more affinity for the open channels than, than the inactivated state. And they dissociate pretty slow from... Uh, the channels themselves. So once they kind of bind onto them in the open state, they like to stick around for a little while. And so you can see how this will affect um, the action potential itself. Okay. There are three drugs that fit into the 1A category. So you're like, finally, we'll get to the drugs. Yes. Right. No one likes drugs. Anyway, um, so the one, the thing I use to remember my class 1A antiarrhythmics is PDQ. So you think the 1A antiarrhythmics are pretty darn quick. Um, so the first one's going to be quinidine. So this is our Q. Um, this is actually the D isomer of quinine. Do you guys know what uh, popular drink you might find quinine in? Hey, you'll find it in your gin and tonics. Primarily the tonic water actually contains quinine. That's why if you ever put it underneath a black light, it actually glows. Right? So you ever got drinking gin and tonic, that's why it, it glows up. Um, not that I would know from personal experience. I'm just saying this is what happens. I've seen it on, on YouTube. Uh, anyway. <laughs> 
there's also, uh, it's interesting because it actually has some anti-malarial properties as well. So it can actually have a little bit of uh, effects on it. We used to use quinine quite a bit for treating uh, malaria back in the day before we had kind of more effective drugs. But anyway, uh, it's a very old sort of drug. You'll see a lot of these um, class one uh, antiarrhythmics are pretty old drugs for the most part. So quinine, um, again, it's going to help with that uh, slow conduction, helps to prolong that refractory period. So if you did have an area of the heart which is kind of sending an aberrant signal along, you can kind of prevent it and slow it down and help to prevent that reinsurance arrhythmia from developing uh, an issue there, right? So that's going to be good. Also, it's going to help to decrease automaticity. All good things if you're having, uh, you know, ventricular arrhythmia, potentially uh, an atrial arrhythmia, it can be useful there. Now, there's a lot of side effects you're going to see with these older drugs. So you can see some anticholinergic effects here. Uh, what do you think it might do to heart rate? Anticholinergic if I was, you know, decreasing the amount of, of or activity of acetylcholine in the muscarinic receptors in the heart, it would do what to your heart rate? Potentially go up, right? So I could potentially go up. You can see things like dry mouth, the urinary retention. So think about all the side effects you can see due to blocking um, acetylcholine. And remember, um, a lot of our first generation antihistamines have kind of similar effects, right? I mentioned those have anti muscarinic activity there. And then um, at higher doses, you can actually see some alpha blocking effect as well. And what do you think that would do to blood pressure? Yeah, it decreases. So you can have an issue if you were to have, say, a really high dose being given. The patient's already hypotensive due to the fact that they're, you know, in an arrhythmia where they don't have really any cardiac output. It's going to potentially worse than that, right? So there's some things to consider when you're given a drug like this. So this uh, main kind of indications where you might use quinidine include things like uh, if they want to maintain arrhythmia, uh, an arrhythm, I should say, um, with things like A-flutter, A-fib, those are the primary things. This is going to be more of an issue of rhythm control. We'll see with things like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, those are going to be more of that rate control as we'll uh, talk about in a uh, few minutes. But this is a form of rhythm control. The idea is to maintain the heart in a normal rhythm rather than uh, reverting back to things like A-fib or A-flutter in these cases. Um, in some cases, it can be used to control ventricular uh, tachycardias. Um, in some cases, you might actually use this to convert someone. This is called a chemical cardioversion. You guys heard of this? What's the other form of cardioversion? Hmm? Yeah, you can use electric, right? So there's the electrical or chemical. Obviously, electrical is, um, in a lot of cases, going to be preferred, especially with like a really unstable patient. But if you have someone who's relatively stable, um, you know, cardioversion, uh, electric, does it feel pretty good for the patient? No, you're, you're basically electrocuting them for a brief period of time. It doesn't feel too great, but this is another way you can do that potentially, uh, sometimes less effective in, in some cases. But sometimes you can use it to convert someone from a flutter uh, and fibrillation back to a normal rhythm potentially. So that'd be one thing you do. Um, now, when you have someone who has like a, a poorly functioning atria, is just kind of sitting there quivering, what is what potential uh, do you have to develop in that atria? A clot, right? Blood just kind of sitting there, kind of pooling around will end up uh, forming clots potentially. And so this is why it's really important. Anytime you're doing like a chemical cardioversion um, or even electrical cardioversion for that matter, anytime you're dealing with a flood or a fib, um, you're converting someone, you have to worry about these anticoagulants and make sure those are on board. We'll talk about that in the heme section that will come up next to make sure patients um, do not uh, dislodge a clot and then develop, you know, getting a stroke or something like that, right? So one of the big things you got to watch out for. And they would also oftentimes use it with uh, digoxin. Again, it's kind of an old uh, thing. We don't really use quinidine for this purpose as much anymore uh, uh, for that purpose. The other thing you have to watch out for is a 2D6 inhibitor. So CYP2D6, you know, it's uh, a lesser known than 3A4 for sure, but um, it can uh, help with certain things like metabolizing uh, codeine over into the active form of morphine. So this can be one of those cases where patients on morphine for, or, I'm sorry, codeine for pain control, they can't convert that to morphine. It's not going to really work so well. So that could be one issue you run into there. Um, CYP2D6 inhibitors also can affect a lot of um, psych meds, but we'll talk about that in a later section of the class. So lots of toxicity associated with quinidine, which is probably why we don't use it too, too often anymore, but lots of nausea, vomiting, lots of diarrhea associated with it. Um, and again, it can cause arrhythmias itself. So you have to be really careful watching the dose, make sure you don't induce a new atrial or ventricular arrhythmia here. Um, can have thrombocytopenia associated with it, can be fatal if not caught and treated uh, effectively. And then it has this um, kind of unique side effect called synchronism. You know why it gets that name? Anyone know where quinine comes from? There's actually a tree that it comes from. It's called the Sincona tree. And so this is where the term synchonism uh, comes from. But basically, there's a very kind of classic triad of symptoms that come along with uh, quinidine. Um, so it's uh, tinnitus. You can see dizziness and blurred vision associated with it. Kind of blurred vision is more associated with anticholinergic effects. But if you were to hear that, it's kind of classic triad of symptoms for the synchonism. You see quinidine. Okay. Um, and again, due to those arrhythmias it can develop, uh, quinidine sudden death has been reported before where basically a patient goes into an arrhythmia and dies uh, if they're not caught very early. And then torsades is another uh, issue here as well. Right. So lots of side effects with it. Probably why we don't use it too, too commonly anymore. But again, it's important to at least be familiar with it uh, when you're talking about antiarrhythmics.
Next up, we have a drug called procainamide. This is the P of the PDQ. Uh, and so this one is probably used a little bit more commonly than quinidine. I see this used uh, somewhat occasionally in the ER if we need to do like an emergent, like a uh, chemical cardio version. Um, but again, this is going to be affecting in the, that, that uh, open sodium channel. And there's going to have the same effects on the EKG as you would see with something like quinidine. Um, nice thing here, there's less uh, side effects associated with it. You don't see the same anticholinergic activity, no real alpha blocking activity. It's very uh, good from that standpoint. And then even as a, an active metabolite called NAPA, uh, not like where you get the wine, but it's uh, NAPA. I don't know the actual full name for it, but um, basically has this, uh, some class three activities. So it can actually have some effects to block those potassium channels and so it can be useful for helping again with those kind of ventricular arrhythmias. This is another one that goes to that acetylation. You guys remember the last drug we talked about that had that? Hydralazine. You guys remember any other drugs we talked about with that? Back in the palm section? The TB drug. Mm -hmm. the TB drug. Which TB drug? Isoniazid. Isoniazid was the other one that uh, went through acetylation. So um, again, you may find people who are fast acetylators may actually make too much of this metabolite and you may actually see toxicity from that, right? So uh, you be very careful. And again, we don't really have a, a common test that we do for testing for acetylation for these patients. So it's kind of one of those things where you just kind of, um, you know, kind of dosing it and then seeing how they respond and going from there. So um, again, we mentioned that lupus-like syndrome. This is another one where you can see that similar to the hydralazine we mentioned. Again, oftentimes in the slow acetylating patients. Um, and again, very similar uh, you know, side effects we can see to the quinidine, usually much less severe in a lot of cases, which is nice. Uh, less hypotension, um, you know, re really low chance of having things like bone marrow uh, suppression, things like that. Um, and so usually we're going to give this IV uh, for some patients who have a uh, second ventricular arrhythmia that's not really being treated with uh, much else. Um, we can utilize it for, for IV use. Um, not really done uh, on, on the chronic side of things kind of as an oral form, um, but very often you might see use IV for kind of short term kind of cardioversion. You know, disopyramide, this is the D of PDQ. Um, this one is going to have very similar effects to quinidine, more anticholinergic action, so it can actually have more side effects from that standpoint. You can see there, and it's going to have a negative inotrope. Again, I don't know that I've seen this one used too, too frequently, um, but of course, uh, I can utilize it for ventricular tachycardias or for supraventricular arrhythmias, usually AFib or AFLUT are the most common ones. I think you mentioned the, the anti-muscarinic effects here you're going to watch out for. And again, you know, a lot of these things, again, are going to be class effects. So you can see torsades are going to be a class effect for all of these, um, all of these, you know, type 1A anti-arrhythmic. So again, just kind of think of them as a group and kind of put them all together. But just note those kind of unique side effects with things like quantity and et cetera. Okay. Any questions from the first half? Are you guys like, man, I wish you had this last week? Maybe a little bit? That's all right. That's okay. All good things with time. Uh, anyway, so going on to our class 1B antiarrhythmics now. So some of these will uh, probably sound a little familiar to you. At least one of them should. Um, this is actually working on shortening phase 3. Uh, and so this is going to have a little bit different affinity for that channel than what we saw with the, the 1As, essentially. So um, you'll see it actually works on the inactivated sodium channel, uh, binding to that with a higher affinity. Um, and so what's interesting is it actually has a little bit higher affinity in the ischemic tissue. And the nice thing is it kind of spares normal healthy tissue for the most part so this is sometimes used um and, and actually one of the ones here lidocaine we'll talk about used to get recommended more often with mi because the big issue with mi obviously is you're having these areas of ischemic heart tissue and so you could utilize something like lidocaine it would help to uh help try to um, restore normal uh, kind of electrical electrical activity in these hearts because you know i mentioned you know, if you have kind of dead tissue what's that do to the conduction typically Kind of slows it down. So you can see here, if I can shorten it up a little bit, it might help it to kind of, um, you know, use uh, have an action potential similar to uh, before the, the tissue became ischemic in the first place, right? And in pretty rapid dissociation, so it comes off pretty quickly. So again, this is going to help to decrease that ectopic foci automaticity, right? So if you had the area of the heart that was kind of um, sending off an action potential, kind of acting as a pacemaker when it really shouldn't be, this can be useful for that as well, which is another issue you run into. Yes. Um, aren't all the class one sodium channel blockers, or is it just? Well, uh, they're all sodium channel blockers, so one A, B, and C, they're all sodium channel blockers, but how they affect those sodium channels differs, right? So go back and look, and you'll see, like, the one A's, they typically affect the open channel versus this one affecting more the inactivated channel, right? Okay, they're all sodium channel blockers. They're all sodium channel blockers, right? So the main one here is lidocaine. Where do we normally see lidocaine being used? Anesthesia, anesthesia right, because it's a local anesthetic. And so does anyone know how it acts as a local anesthetic? How does it cause anesthesia? Because we just talked about it being an antiarrhythmic that blocks sodium channels. So the same thing goes for how it acts as a local anesthetic. So if I were to, say, lacerate my finger and I were to do a digital block and I inject lidocaine into that area, basically what it's doing is when you're sending these painful signals up to the nerves, how does the action potential propagate? 
through action potentials, as I just said, but what channels do they use? <laughs> sodium. Yeah, sodium. Channel. Remember, going from that, that node of Ranvier, uh, uh, you know, kind of crossing that, the, the sheaths of myelin, the sodium channels are super important for that, right? That's how I, you know, we can go back and look at those action potential uh, charts from, from back in physio, but sodium channels are super important for that. If I deaden those, if I block sodium influx, and especially if it's working kind of more rapidly firing nerves, like you would see with like a painful finger or something, then you can block that and actually prevent uh, transmission of the signal. So even though the pain is still there, your brain's never getting that signal in the first place. So you can see how that kind of works. Um, cocaine does a similar thing. Like cocaine used to be used as like a topical anesthetic um, because it blocks sodium channels very similarly to this, right? So um, some things we can use this for certain types of arrhythmias like Wolf, Wolf Parkinson White. Um, we can use this for VTAC or premature uh, like PVCs, premature ventricular contractions can be useful to help prevent those um, like VFib. And again, I mentioned this is uh, primarily where lidocaine got a lot of use in the IV form was for, for MI. It's not used quite so often anymore if you were to have a ventricular arrhythmia. If you had like an MI and patient goes into v, um, VTAC or VFib, you guys know what anti, uh, antiarrhythmic we go with nowadays? Is that one of us that we fall back to all the time? Amio, yeah, Amio kind of has taken over in a lot of cases. If you were to go to like look at old ACLS um, guidelines, they would have uh, lidocaine as kind of being like a first line agent, but nowadays Amio is kind of taken it, kind of supplanted. I, I don't even know if lidocaine is mentioned in the ACLS guidelines. I haven't looked at it recently, but Amio is kind of our go to drug in most of those cases. So anyway, so again, we'll get this IV, um, and this is because it actually needs to be given IV. It gets kind of chewed up by first pass if it goes to the liver, if you were to give it orally. So we don't um, use it that way. We use the IV primarily. Um, and again, it's going to bind to either the mostly inactivated channels, but also the open channels, and it, and it typically dissociates pretty quickly from there. Um, yeah. Now, this is going to be most effective in those channels with ischemic tissue, which is why we used it in MI for a while, because that is where you're getting new ischemic tissue developing there. Um, and we'll kind of spare that normal tissue, which is nice. Um, now, this would not be effective against atrial arrhythmias, really is only going to be for ventricular ones in general. Now, lidocaine and any kind of general anesthetic, you have to be really careful with these because it causes pretty significant um, uh, neurotoxicity. You can see alter mental status. You can see seizures develop. You can see twitches, you know, things like that that can happen. Um, and if you were to see like nystagmus on the patient, that could be one of the first signs they're kind of building up levels too much. Um, so you got to be careful with patients who are um, either have liver dysfunction or that's probably the primary thing, but even some some renal dysfunction, you can they can hold on to the drug too. Uh, too much and levels can build up and you see these toxicities there. Um, but this is one of those things where it's, uh, you have to give it via continuous drip. You know, so you have a patient who's having an acute ventricular arrhythmia, you give them a bolus dose and you give them a loading dose because that helps to get them to get to what earlier? Yep, so you get steady state very quickly, and then you get, give it via continuous drip. And so a patient with like hepatic dysfunction, you'd actually drop that by half, um, just to make sure they didn't build up levels too much. But uh, other things to watch out for, you can see some hypersensitivity. Some people have like lidocaine allergies and things like that. We'll talk more about that when we get to the surgery section. Um, but just be aware of that. And then uh, watch out for if they have a history of seizures. This could exacerbate that. And then elderly patients tend to have, um, again, organ dysfunction may lead them to have more and more side effects from this. Another one uh, is this analog of lidocaine called maxillotine. Again, I've never actually seen this one used clinically. I've certainly seen lidocaine used uh, with some regularity, but this might be another one you'll see uh, being used occasionally. And again, this is going to be uh, orally available. So instead of lidocaine getting chewed up by the liver, you can actually give this one orally. So this could be useful for helping to maintain normal rhythm for, for the chronic period. Um, and this can be useful in helping uh, patients with like prolonged you know, congenital QT prolongation, which can be useful um, to help kind of shorten that up a little bit and help them to, uh, you know, prevent, you know, an acute uh, ventricular arrhythmia from developing and, and then kind of a sudden death kind of syndrome there. Um, and then anyways, that's kind of the main thing you might see that you use for it. Again, clinically not used super, super often, but. And finally, we have our 1C antiarrhythmics. These are going to be slowing uh, phase zero. These are kind of act very similar to uh, the class 1A, essentially. So if you kind of looked at how the, the action potential changes, pretty pretty similar for the most part. But it's going to help to slow conduction, prolong that refractory period, essentially, um, and help kind of prevent the range of arrhythmias from developing there. Um, will affect the normal heart. So really, that 1B uh, classification of like only really working in ischemic tissue, that's kind of unique to the 1Bs. But this one will affect kind of normal tissue as well. Um, the Drugs we have here is going to be flecainide, and then we'll have another one called propafenone. These are uh, kind of a little bit notorious. That's, I kind of got the sense for that when I was in, in pharmacy school because we used to use these ones. Um, you ever heard of pill in a pocket? Kind of an old term, but basically you'd have these patients who um, they would kind of know if they went into like AFib, right? Flooding. A lot of times they can they can feel it, um, and so they would actually use these drugs as a form of rhythm control. They felt like they're having arrhythmia come along. They can go ahead and take a pill, basically carry it around with them, and you kind of use it as an as needed basis. We don't really do that anymore. We found there's like some increased uh, mortality associated with it, um, but these can be useful for helping with uh, that rhythm control essentially and preventing a patient uh, from having the symptoms of uh, an arrhythmia by preventing it from happening in the first place. 
But we're going to see that um, this is going to be useful for prolonging the PR, QRS, and QT interval by blocking the sodium channel. So again, the whole, basically the, the whole cardiac cycle is going to get prolonged in these cases. Um, and again, this can help to prevent premature uh, uh, ventricular contraction. This is one of the other uses we used it for occasionally. Again, you could use it for like life-threatening sustained uh, arrhythmias. Uh, this could also be useful for uh, atrial arrhythmias as well. So again, 1Bs are primarily going to be used, utilized for, for ventricular arrhythmias. 1As and 1Cs can be used for kind of either, essentially. Um, and again, we don't like to use this in patients with structural heart damage because uh, you find you know, increased risk for other arrhythmias to develop, and it's kind of no good for, the, for those patients. As far as toxicity goes, again, you can see that this can, again, develop their own uh, ventricular uh, arrhythmias. And again, it's one of those things where once you have the, the drug effect on the heart, it's hard to take that away, right? It's hard to kind of overcome that in a lot of cases. So this is why, you know, drug-induced arrhythmias can be so difficult to treat in a lot, a lot of times. So you got to be careful with that. Um, so you can see some uh, uh, blurred vision, tremor associated with it, you know, seizures in some cases. Um, and again, we mentioned we used to do this in, in patients with uh, arrhythmias after MI. And again, this is where we saw that increased mortality. So again, this one doesn't use quite so often, um, but maybe used uh, occasionally. The other one's propafenone. Um, this one is going to have similar mechanism to flecainide, but also has some beta blocking activity. So it can be useful for kind of a, uh, um, you know, tachyarrhythmia can help kind of slow things down a little bit from that standpoint. Um, but again, worry about the proarrhythmia. Actually, I actually had one really sad uh, case where I had a patient who, um, he was a younger guy that had a congenital heart defect. I'm not sure what it was essentially, but he was on propafenone um, kind of long term. Unfortunately, he was very depressed and ended up taking all of the propafenone at once. Uh, it was very, very difficult to treat arrhythmia. Unfortunately, we ended up losing that patient. Um, but if you were to think about, you know, if you had too much of this drug on board, uh, we know the sodium channels are being blocked. How do you think you could unblock them, essentially? Hmm? Well, not potassium necessarily. What could I use a lot of to try to flow through those channels? Yeah, you could actually use sodium. So that's one of those things where I actually give a lot of sodium bicarbonate. We'll actually give them a bolus of that to try to reset those channels by kind of pushing the drug through, essentially, and kind of unblocking it. So that's one of those things where we recommended using like a ton of sodium bicarbonate. Unfortunately, the patient uh, just had too much drug on board and, and did not do so well. Um, but anyway, another drug we don't use too, too often, but you may see like some old school cardiologists using this occasionally, or if they have, uh, you know, some congenital issue where the, you know, this is really one of the things like you guys don't want to be prescribing this very often. It really needs to be someone who's um, specifically trained for that. Or you know, if you guys are working specifically in a cardio office, like that would be the place you're going to more often use it. Okay. That's so for the, the class one. Uh, antiarrhythmic. Now we get to move into more kind of familiar waters, essentially. So we're going to have class two, which are beta blockers. And as you might imagine, we said that what type of arrhythmias are going to be uh, well suited to, to beta blockers? Ventricular arrhythmias? Yeah, typically supraventricular arrhythmias, right? So anything kind of above the ventricle should be treated with uh, these beta blockers because it's going to help to slow down conduction, helps us decrease automaticity and prolong that AV uh, conduction there, right? Um, you can see it actually decreased that phase four depolarization a little bit, um, help that to prolong it and prevent the heart from beating quite so fast, essentially. So um, propranolol is kind of a, a prototype, but again, any of the beta blockers could be used for this. And again, all the same caveats go along with um, what we talked about before as far as beta blockers go. So again, you know, what can mask the signs of hypoglycemia? Everyone should know it's beta blockers now, right? So that's one of those things where uh, the hypoglycemic, you know, uh, you get all the symptoms of um, sympathetic nervous system, you know, blocking those beta receptors can, can mask those signs there. Um, but again, uh, propranolol can be useful for this, but, you know, if you had an asthmatic patient, you'd probably want to use cardioselective beta blocker, you know, so again, you guys don't know a lot of that already. Um, but this can be useful for helping to suppress things like premature uh, ventricular beats. Um, even this can be somewhat membrane stabilizing, kind of mentioned that effect previously, but it helps to just kind of um, stabilize my cardium a little bit more to help prevent arrhythmias from developing. So this might be one you see used occasionally. Again, mainly you're going to see it for uh, SVTs or primary use. We're going to see here. Obviously, we talked about beta blockers being used in, in MIs. Um, again, a lot of times, you know, patients presenting for MI might be hypotensive to begin with or bradycardic in some cases. So again, you got to be careful when you're going to use um, uh, these drugs and make sure that it kind of makes sense based on their cardiovascular status. Obviously, we know the side effects uh, associated with this. You can see worsening heart failure, heart block can be associated with this, bronchospasm, using a non-selective beta blocker. Um, again, you can see worsening heart failure uh, for those patients having kind of poor uh, function already, which I already kind of mentioned. That's how important it is. I put it twice. Definitely wasn't a typo.
I uh, mentioned metoprolol, ace butyl, those would be good cardioselective examples there. So again, know which patients might be uh, more beneficial in, uh, depending on you know, kind of what their, their situation is. Um, a good one that we'll use occasionally is called Esmolol. I mentioned that previously. This is an IV only beta blocker. That's a very, very short acting, um, uh, very short half-life. And so it's good because you can actually utilize it and titrate it very easily, right? So this would be given via continuous infusion. It basically bolus them with a big dose of Esmolol. The brain name's Revoblox, so it kind of shows you how short acting it is. Um, and you can titrate the dose essentially to get your patient heart rate right where you want it to be essentially so this would be a, a case where you're not necessarily fixing the arrhythmia right it's not a case of rhythm control but this is rate control so if you had an afib or any flutter you can slow down that conduction so instead of the ventricles trying to keep up with the atria they are slowed down essentially uh, can help to uh, prevent the the symptoms of an atrial arrhythmia from from developing right okay um our class three uh drugs here are going to be blocking those potassium channels. So this is primarily going to be affecting this repolarization phase here, right? So uh, QT prolongation is going to be the, one of the big things you're going to see uh, associated with this. Um, also prolong that refractory period as well, which is why it can be very useful for helping you know, block those range and rhythms um, and helps to prolong that the action potential duration essentially. Now amio is going to be our uh, kind of prototype kind of drug, a prototypical drug for this category. Uh, again, it's a very useful kind of broad spectrum sort of antiarrhythmic. Uh, you can use it for you know, treatment resistant AFib, flutter. You can use it for ventricular arrhythmias. And again, a lot of times if you had a patient, um, for instance, who is say having, uh, say they were coding, right? And you're kind of going through your ACLS guidelines, you know, if you cannot, um, you know, if you try electricity and try to uh, defibrillate them and that's not working, amio is kind of a, the next thing you kind of go to in a lot of those cases. So again, this will probably be uh, one of the most commonly used emergent type of antiarrhythmics you'll see out there. But you'll notice here it's a very long half-life, so it can range anywhere between 26 to 107 days. It's not hours, but it's days. Um, so what do you think that means as far as, you know, if I needed, the patient was, you know, dying on me, and I need to get him treated immediately, what do you think I would need to do as far as the first dose goes? Give them a big bolus, right? So you give them a big loading dose to get them up to uh, steady state, essentially, and then you give them a continuous infusion afterwards. So um, you can do that IV, and then eventually you transition them over to PO. That's why you see some patients being on this kind of long term, and would help prevent those arrhythmias from coming back. So again, this would be another case of rhythm control in most cases. Um, so really, you can use this for uh, you know recurrent VTAC, VFib, if they're especially if it's resistant to other drugs. Uh, and again, this can help to maintain kind of a normal rate and rhythm in, in AFib. So that'd be the other case we'd use this for. And as I mentioned, you know, it's rapidly replacing lidocaine in most cases, especially like MI and things like that. Uh, Amio just tends to be a little bit more effective at treating those arrhythmias. Um, and this, what's nice here, it's not just specifically blocking potassium channels, it has some other um, uh, effects as well. It can help with sodium channels as well, help to block some calcium channels, can block alpha and beta. So that's kind of a wide range of effects you can see here, but it ultimately it's helping to decrease the automaticity, so it can slow down the heart rate, uh, decrease that conduction, and prolong that refractory period. So this is why it's so effective at treating a wide range of arrhythmias, because that's kind of multiple effects here. Now, the toxicity is pretty bad with this one, especially with more chronic use. Um, certainly kind of acutely, uh, if you were to give, say, too much of a dose, you know, too big a one, you can, or you were to give it too fast, you can end up seeing bradycardia, hypotension associated with it. That's kind of the kind of the acute things you want to worry about. But more chronically, you have patients on this for years, uh, this is an issue that can pop up. So you can sort of see things like pulmonary fibrosis. This can be potentially lethal, this thing that develops over a year's time frame. Um, you can see some neurotoxicity like muscle weakness, ataxia, and then they actually end up having uh, amio will deposit into the skin and they have a blue gray kind of discoloration of the skin that can be non-reversible in some cases so you're seeing you know a patient looking kind of dusky sometimes that can be related back to the amio kind of causing that that uh, skin color change um cause some corneal uh, deposits can cause some vision changes there and then it's interesting for the thyroid effects you actually either cause hyper or hypothyroidism depending on the patient so be one of those things you kind of monitor for changes monitor the tsh over time see how that goes and then uh, just be aware as far as interactions go, we can end up seeing that a lot of the antiarrhythmics are going to have kind of um, synergistic effects with one another, right? So you can worry about seeing either uh, inducing an arrhythmia or see hypotension, bradycardia, things like that. Um, but you end up seeing increased effect from things like even warfarin, which is an anticoagulant we'll talk about in the next section. Um, you know, flecainide, procainamide, they tend to be, uh, you know, see increased risk for toxicity. Okay, another class three is ibutilide or Corvert. Um, this again is not used nearly as commonly as amio that I've seen, uh, but again, we'll have very similar actions by blocking those potassium channels. Again, this was another one you may use uh, for treating things like eighth letter, a fifth, things like that. And again, uh, you always want to worry about whenever you're blocking those potassium channels is you're going to prolong QT, run the risk of seeing um, uh, torsades. Does anyone know what like, a normal QT interval is? QTC interval, I should say? Hmm? 
Yeah, like 440. Uh, who's it usually longer for, males or females? Yeah. yeah, usually a little bit longer for females. So, you know, when you're looking at this, you know, again, you have to take it with a grain of salt. But, like, if I'm monitoring, like, a patient who's uh, overdosed on some meds that prolong QT, um, you know, I usually don't start to get really concerned until it starts to get, like, 500, 550. Once it gets around, like, 600 or so, that's when you really start to get, you know, concerned there. Um, why do I call it QTC? It's the corrected based on... Yeah, the heart rate essentially. Yeah, so again, it's one of those things where um, a lot of times you'll uh, end up seeing that the EKG will spit out a number, which you know usually good enough for like my purposes, who doesn't read EKGs commonly. But you can sometimes find that it can be um, sometimes over exaggerating, uh, and so sometimes it's good to actually measure it out yourself and uh, come up with your own QTC. There's a whole formula you can do for it, so um, just be careful with that. Uh, again, sometimes it'll read up a little bit more prolonged. You might get a little, little worried when there's really nowhere to be had. Okay, uh, this is actually another one I actually see a lot of patients being started on um, for either, um, you know, maintaining normal rhythm in AFib. This is probably the most common place I'll see this. It's called dofetilide or ticosin. And so this is going to be a pure uh, potassium channel blocker. And so we're going to see that this can help maintain a normal rhythm there. Um, and so it really has actually a pretty limited uh, availability. So it needs to be relegated to patients um, who are under the care of a cardiologist. Um, it's actually one of the big things what we will start this in the hospital in a lot of cases because if the patient has an issue with it, they develop an arrhythmia, you want to be able to catch it while they're in the hospital and not have them like, you know, die out when they're in their house, right? Um, so this is one of those ones where like my wife working more mainly in the adult side, um, this is a big thing you have to monitor um, for a lot of electrolytes, you have to make sure you counsel the patient appropriately because we're going to see this can make a big difference. Um, so you have to monitor for things like potassium. You have to monitor for things like magnesium because you have big shifts in there, especially if you have a patient with like renal dysfunction or something. That can lead you to be a higher risk for having these arrhythmias. So it's really important with your potassium blockers to make sure you have normal potassium levels. So, again, it can cause pretty marked QT prolongation when a monitor for, and then you have to watch out for kidney dysfunction for Tikison because if they don't have good function, they're going to hold on to it and see so more likely to see an arrhythmia, right? So, it's a very dangerous drug in the sense that if you don't use it appropriately, you can pretty easily kill somebody, but uh, it can be very useful and very effective for treating those and maintaining a normal rhythm for those patients. And then, Sotolol, what type of drug is this? Beta blocker. Did I put the slides out of order? No, probably not. Sometimes I will, but not this time. Um, so this is uh, kind of a, a mixed kind of uh, drug here. Because we mentioned beta blockers are which class? Two. So this one's actually a class uh, considered class three because not only is it a beta blocker, but also has some potassium blocking ability as well. So sodalol is kind of interesting because it works more a little bit like amio than you would see with like some of the other beta blockers uh, for sure. Um, so again, can be utilized for AFib, a flutter, sometimes for ventricular arrhythmias. This is a good like kind of more um, kind of chronic one the patients might be sent home on uh, potentially instead of something like amio because you see less side effects associated with it. Again, helps to block that nodal conduction, blocks the potassium channels, so it can all be useful. Again, toxicity, because this is not a cardioselective one, be careful with your asthmatic patients. Um, be careful, with, you know, with that risk of torsades. Um, you got to be careful when you're looking at multiple drugs that can prolong QT, because, again, you might not be on, uh, you might be on Sotolol, say, for, you know, treatment of AFib, but what happens if you get prescribed, say, Levaquin, right? So now all of a sudden you have two drugs that can prolong QT. Uh, you got to watch out for that. You sometimes need to do uh, EKGs to make sure to make sure it's not getting too prolonged. And then obviously the beta blocking effects here, so if you had CHF, you know, that can worsen it, et cetera. And then finally, we have our class four uh, antiarrhythmics, so this is going to be your calcium channel blockers. Uh, are these dihydropyridines or non dihydropyridines? Do you think? Non dihydropyridines. So these are only the non dihydropyridines we're going to be focusing on here, right? Um, so diltiazem, verapamil are the main class four antiarrhythmics, and, and lodipine, things like that, wouldn't really be considered an antiarrhythmic at all, okay? So these are going to be working to block those calcium channels, helps to decrease automaticity. This will be used in the same, uh, similar situations as what you'd use for a beta blocker, essentially, right? Um, helping for those kind of supraventricular sort of arrhythmias. Um, again, rapamil, diltiazem, we talked about these pretty exhaustively already, um, but just be aware they are going to be kind of most effective in active tissue. So if someone who's kind of already having an arrhythmia, uh, this can help to kind of slow things down pretty effectively in that really active tissue there. Um, but the big thing is going to be depressing AV conduction, SA conduction, and, and slowing down that, or decreasing that contractility. Obviously, um, supraventricular tachycardias are kind of one of the primary places we'll see this. Um, uh, I mentioned the other drug that we use for SVTs a lot. Adenosine is the other big one. So sometimes we'll use this as kind of a backup to adenosine. If we can't break someone's SVT with adenosine, this is kind of one, a good go-to drug. So either verapamil diltiazem can be utilized. Um, sometimes beta blockers. It just depends on the patient. But like in Nemours, we'll jump back to using diltiazem in a lot of cases. 
Um, also can help control rate with AFib. Again, it's not going to be rhythm control necessary because it doesn't convert the rhythm. It just slows down that rate there to make sure uh, the ventricles aren't trying to pump too fast. Um, we all know the side effects already, but hypotension, you know, depressed ejection fractions would not be good for like a uh, heart failure patient, obviously. So you can be careful with those, um, those type of patients. Okay, so next uh, we're gonna have a kind of a, a few miscellaneous agents. We have adenosine, uh, digoxin or digitalis, and then finally we have magnesium. Anyone know what we use magnesium for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, torsades so is gonna be the, the big drug there. So we'll talk about that in a second. So adenosine, anyone ever given adenosine for before for SVT? What's it look like? Yep, super scary whenever you give it. Um, so adenosine is really kind of interesting because we have adenosine receptors that are available on the heart. You also have adenosine up in the, in the CNS as well. Typically, adenosine kind of acts like the major like brake. It's kind of like pumping the e-brake on your car, right? So basically, you pull pull the lever. It's going to stop everything for a brief second, and then it's like letting go off of it because the half-life of the drug is super, super short, you know, around 10 seconds or so. So the drug gets in, does its thing, and then leaves, which can be useful if you have something like an SVT where you have a very rapid rhythm uh, being transmitted from the atria to the ventricles. You can slow things down. You can basically stop it first split second and then it'll kind of kick back in hopefully in a normal rhythm at that point so it kind of resets the heart essentially um by re by hyperpolarizing these cells essentially by making them very very difficult to trigger drug goes away and all of a sudden it can reset itself uh so very useful and usually uh you'll end up doing like a continuous ekg on these patients so that way you can monitor and see when they go uh basically you know they'll have like a super fast heart rate uh they're going like you know 180 beats a minute uh, actually, i actually had a six week old one time that came in they were like a 280 so you know heart fetal heart rates or, you know, infant heart rates can be very, very quick, but um, basically you'll, you'll give them the adenosine, it'll kind of flatline for almost like a second, and then hopefully it'll come back. Everyone's kind of holding their breath for it to come back, but um, once they come back, then, then you're kind of good to go. The key, though, is you have to really make sure that you administer the drug with super, uh, uh, you have to make sure you do it appropriately. If you don't do it appropriately, the drug's not going to work that well. So we mentioned, you know, typically when you're giving these drugs, where are you giving it through? An IV, right? Where the IV is normally placed. Yeah, you like usually in the arm, right? So again, it has to travel all the way through the veins back over to the heart, essentially to be effective. And so if you, you know, if you just kind of push in leisurely, that 10 seconds goes by pretty quick and now half your drug is gone, right? So you need to make sure you push it really quickly. And so normally what we'll do is we'll have kind of a, a, a two syringe method. Basically, you'll have like a drug or a syringe with your drug in it. You're going to have another syringe with your saline flush in it, right? Usually like 10 mLs of saline. And then you'll have like a three-way stopcock essentially. And the other end's cooked up to the patient. And so essentially when you're ready to give it, you're going to push the drug in and then you have to push that saline behind it very, very quickly to make sure the drug actually gets to the patient. Because a lot of times, um, anyone know the dosing for adenosine? Yeah, 6, 12, and 12 usually, or 6, 6, and 12, however you, however you want to do it. Um, but essentially, you end up doubling the dose at some point if the first one doesn't work. And what I see more commonly is that uh, someone will give the drug. They may not give it quickly enough, and they'll say, well, it didn't work. And then they double the dose, and all of a sudden, it does work. And a lot of times, it has to do with the fact that they just did not push it quickly enough the first time. So again, administration is very, very important there. Um, again, we use this primarily for uh, uh, SVT, uh, sometimes in some cases for Wolf-Parkinson-White. And the main toxicities you're going to run into include like a lot of flushing, you can see with that. Um, um, shortness of breath, it kind of get this impending doom kind of feeling because again, you're stopping the heart for a second uh, and it's kind of burning kind of chest, uh, burning the chest feeling. And then we talked about digoxin already. We mentioned digoxin's mechanism is what? Lots of yeah, sodium potassium ATPase pump is the main thing that gets affected by that. So we're blocking the sodium potassium pump. We are, what does that do to intracellular calcium levels? Just remember? increases the calcium levels, right? Because again, remember there's that sodium calcium antiporter. You can go back and look at your CHF uh, slides. I'm not sure if I put a picture of it here, but essentially what you end up finding is that they're uh, causing more calcium to come into the cell and that can be useful to help um, increase uh, contractility, which can be useful for like CHF patients and stuff. But also by blocking that, you're helping to slow down AV conduction, right? Um, so again, we mentioned that uh, the, the transporter that really helps to maintain that uh, resting membrane potential is a sodium potassium pump, right? Because again, you're always going to be pumping out uh, more sodium and you know, bring in some uh, some degree of potassium. But if you block that, if you prevent that from working, um, you can lead that to uh, you know, slow down your conduction, help to uh, heart to be a little bit slower. So this is why we'd use it for things like AFib, a flutter more more commonly. Also, it can be useful by increasing this um, parasympathetic tone as well. So again, having a little bit more acetylcholine activity on those muscarinic receptors can slow things down as well. This one is not used super, super commonly. You can also use it occasionally for some uh, ventricular, uh, help to slow down ventricular rate. Uh, I see this sometimes used in some of our um, cardiac kids who have like had some kind of congenital malformation and we need to uh, administer this like after surgery to help with contractility and help to prevent arrhythmias from occurring. Um, 
but again, it's going to be useful for helping kind of induce almost like a, a minor heart block to help with uh, control some of that rate there in, in a flib and a, a flutter. Um, we mentioned already that you, know, you have to watch your dosing there. You have to watch your levels to make sure it doesn't like, get too high. Otherwise, you can see that toxicity. Remember that yellowing of the vision? You can see like the halos. Those are things you want to watch out for. You guys remember the name for that? Xanthopsia, right? So that yelling. So again, you can impress your friends with that, uh, your, your massive vocabulary. Okay. And then finally, we have magnesium. Uh, anyone know where else we use magnesium? R rather than just like replacing electrolytes? Yeah, so we'll use it for asthma. Asthma is a very good one because uh, essentially, what, do, what does it do for asthma? Yeah, it works as a smooth muscle relaxant, right? So you can use it as a bronchodilator. So sometimes in uh, status asthmaticus, we'll give cal uh, magnesium, I should say. Uh, where else can we use it? Yeah, pregnancy. So we'll sometimes use it for uh, preeclampsia or eclampsia. It helps as a uh, smooth muscle relaxer for the, the vessel, blood vessels, essentially. So you can sometimes use it for those pregnant patients. Um, here we're going to use it for torsades. This is kind of your go-to drug for torsades. Every crash cart you run into is going to have um, magnesium in it. Uh, also, if you ever look at a crash cart, it'll include things like adenosine is going to be in there for SVT. You'll have things like amio that's going to be in there. Those are the primary antiarrhythmics you'll run into. Some, some lidocaine uh, occasionally. Um, these are the, the big ones. You have to be careful with uh, magnesium. Uh, one of the big things you can see is you can drop someone's pressure pretty significantly because, uh, again, you can drop blood pressure for pregnant patients. You can do it for normal ones as well. Um, not that pregnant patients are abnormal, but you know what I mean. Um, so anyway, it can help to lower blood pressure, helps to uh, uh, kind of uh, reset things a little bit for the heart and help to prevent um, or help to fix a torsades uh, arrhythmia. And that's it for the antiarrhythmics. Any questions on those? Those are the primary ones you're going to run into. Yes. Um, because if the, so the, one of the issues is, is if you have a uh, ventricular arrhythmia that's happening, right? So say for instance, that is being propagated by the actual ventricles themselves. What you want to have is you want to have the SA node and the AV node kind of reestablish kind of their, um, their primary control over heart rate, essentially. So if you give something that slows down that uh, conduction, then that, that ventricular rhythm is just going to stick around, right? So instead, if I can give something that may, uh, increase the conduction there, kind of reestablish a normal rhythm, that's going to be beneficial for the patients. Yeah. So it just depends on the arrhythmia. Um, a lot of times, you know, the electrophysiologist can go through, they can look at an EKG and tell you exactly where things are going on, what type of drugs you should use based on what, and it gets very, very complicated from there. But this at least you have a, a baseline knowledge of like where you should use which uh, type of uh, uh, drugs here as, as far as antiarrhythmics go. Yes. Really, any sort of AFib you can utilize. So as long as you're having kind of that fast conduction from the atrium to the ventricles, causing a tachycardia, you can slow things down by using uh, like a calcium, uh, you know, non-dihydropyridine or like a beta blocker, right? Because again, you're just trying to slow down that conduction. Because again, um, the issue is when patients become symptomatic is when that conduction is so quick that the ventricles can't really keep up, right? So the ventricles, uh, the cardiac output is not going to be good because the ventricles are just kind of quivering essentially. So if you can slow that down and allow the ventricles to kind of uh, squeeze it at kind of a somewhat normal rate, that's going to be beneficial. So you're kind of almost inducing a mini like kind of heart block essentially. Any other questions? I have 20 minutes. I'm going to go through because uh, the hematology section is pretty big and the chemo section is pretty big. So I'm going to continue on. Sorry for the trick. Okay, let's continue on. Okay, so first off, why do we talk about iron chelated? Why is iron important in hematology? Hmm? Yeah, so it's important for anemia, right? You want to have iron uh, to make sure that we can generate what? Hemoglobin, absolutely. So you need uh, hemoglobin, you need iron for that. So that's important. Who might have too much iron on board? Hmm? Why might they have, or so something's like chronically iron overloaded, I should say. So one, you could overdose on it, right? So you could take too much iron yourself and uh, that can be an issue, right? So sometimes you think like pregnant or non-pregnant patients, but maybe someone has like access to prenatal vitamins. Those have a, usually a high amount of iron in them. It used to be a, another a big killer of kids uh, on accidental ingestions. It used to be a big issue until we changed all the packaging. Um, who else might have issues with this? Okay, so maybe, maybe not processing the iron correctly. That could be one thing. The, the other big thing are people who get a lot of chronic uh, um, uh, transfusions, right? So whenever you give someone packed red blood cells, 
they already contain a lot of hemoglobin. Guess what? They already have a lot of iron there. So as that gets broken down, they, uh, the body has a hard time getting rid of excess iron uh, when you get kind of chronically overloaded like that. So this is where your chelators can be very useful for that. And when I say chelation, what do I mean? Yeah, basically it binds it up and then you can, you know, your body can process and get rid of it. Couple drugs for that. So I mentioned the the body has no good mechanism for removing iron. Um, typically, you more regulate it through uh, your GI tract and by preventing further absorption of iron. So if you already have a lot on board, it's hard to get rid of that uh, in a very quick manner. Uh, mainly because the iron that we absorb is, is typically pretty heavily recycled for the most part. So again, uh, if you have too much iron kind of coming into your diet, your, your GI tract can prevent further absorption. But once it's there, you can't can't uh, get rid of it. So patients who have things like uh, sickle cell disease, they are uh, kind of getting transfusions pretty frequently. They tend to get iron overloaded. Uh, aplastic anemia, anywhere where they're getting kind of frequent transfusions it can run into an issue here. So uh, if you look at a unit of blood, uh, it contains about 250 milligrams of iron. And typically just uh, per day, you only need about 8 to 18 milligrams, uh, depending on, on your situation. So again, you get a ton of iron every time you get a transfusion. This is why it can be an issue for them. Now, the problem, though, you see with this chronic iron overload, is you can see things like hypertrophy and cardiomyopathies develop of the myocardial tissue. Um, sometimes that can be reversible, depending on how kind of severe it is. Um, but you can also see things like pulmonary hypertension. You see diabetes develop here, thyroid dysfunction. So lots of problems about this. So we try to get rid of that extra iron whenever we can. So uh, chelation therapy, again, we want to try to um, get rid of some of the extra iron by binding it up and then the body can process it uh, and get rid of it later on. Uh, a couple of drugs here. Uh, and again, you can kind of see how these drugs will come along. I should use the laser pointer come along kind of uh, work to, to bind up the iron and then your body can process that. The two big ones we'll talk about is called deferoxamine and then uh, deferoxyrox is the other one. I just call it XJ. It's a lot easier to say. So deferoxamine is a, a cool one that was used this for iron overdose. Um, and actually, it uh, turns this uh, urine kind of this red color whenever it binds up iron. It calls it a, this product called desferoxamine that you can pee out. You can actually see if someone's iron overloaded based on their urine here. Call that Vin Rosé, essentially. Um, so again, you use it primarily in overdose. Uh, again, you don't see a ton of iron overdoses nowadays, but if you ever have like someone who is, uh, you know, uh, someone who is worried about getting pregnant or, you know, seen like, uh, I remember there's one really uh, a good case where a girl got into a fight with her boyfriend, uh, decided to take a whole bunch of her iron pills and then got really bad gastroenteritis. Anyone ever taken iron pills before? You get pretty bad GI upset along with this, kind of one of the common things you see there. And uh, of course, she came in uh, to uh, the ER because her boyfriend was like, hey, you need to come in and get checked out. You took all those pills. And so she came in just complaining of some abdominal pain. And then uh, do you guys know uh, if you were to x-ray somebody, uh, you can see iron, right? Because it's one of those things that's radio-opaque. So uh, the resident went ahead and x-rayed the, the belly, didn't find anything, and said, okay, well, you're fine to go. Go ahead and go home. You know, she never really uh, fessed up to her story, so she took like, a few extra pills. So then she goes out and comes back, and it's like kind of, just huge cardiovascular collapse, hypotensive, tachycardic, acidotic, very, very sick. Uh, and so we actually use this drug to help bind up that extra iron, and then they can just eliminate it uh, through the urine, which is, it can be uh, life-saving in a lot of cases. That patient actually did very well, um, considering how just how sick she was. So this is a very useful drug for that. So you can see some hypotension associated with it. It's one of the big things. Pulmonary edema might be another risk. And then you have this Yersinia colitis. Uh, this is actually a, uh, one of the things where you can see after they receive the drug, um, there's certain bacteria that really like iron. Uh, kind of, I um, can't remember the, the term for it. But anyway, you can see you potentially get this uh, colitis due to Yersinia species after receiving this drug. It's kind of a unique side effect with that one. The other thing you'll probably see more. Oh, yes, ma'am. Is it supposed to be the iron in... Yeah, so uh, traditionally, it, and it depends on several things, depending on how dilute the urine is anyway, because usually when they come in sick like that, we're giving them a ton of fluids as well, so they can dilute things out, but you should see that red color change. You can see it on well, we wouldn't have given him that drug initially because he, uh, the doctor didn't have the right story. And so, you know, she's like, oh, I might take an extra iron pill or two. And so he didn't see anything on the x-ray. So he said, oh, you can go home. Uh, but they didn't give that drug to see a color. And actually, before we could do iron levels reliably, we actually used to give IM shots of that. And then if the peak could change color, then we knew they had too much iron on board. And we'd go ahead and give it. So, um, so the problem was we had a lot of iron chelators. We need people that needed iron chelation, but we only had IV agents. Nowadays, we have another one called x which is nice for our like, sickle cell patients and stuff because it's an oral med they can take. And so it's pretty cost effective from that standpoint. Um, pretty well tolerated for the most part. But you can see a lot of the things like headache, rash, you know, nothing too spectacular there. Um, but again, you may need to you know adjust their dose based on side effects. So you ever see like a sickle cell kid who's on this, that's what it's for. So kind of chronically bind up that extra iron. Okay. So... Uh, Real brief on that, and then moving into the antiplatelet drugs, we're going to kind of go antiplatelets into our anticoagulants. So when I say antiplatelet, what type of drugs am I talking about? Aspirin's a good one. What else? Plavix. Anyone know the generic for that one? 
Hit the, hit the grill. Yep, so we'll talk about that. You know any other ones? Warfarin is going to be more of an anticoagulant. So we'll talk about that one a little bit later. Yeah, effiant is going to be a good one. Good. Yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about all. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so we're going to talk about all these here. These are specifically going to be antiplatelet drugs or affecting the platelets directly. We'll talk about the anticoagulants right after this. So, um, looking at hemostasis, obviously this is important because if you don't have effective hemostasis, you'll either bleed out or you'll clot up all over, and it's not going to be good for us, right? Um, so it's important that we be able to clot off areas of injury uh, quickly, and then we don't need that clot anymore. We need to get rid of it, right? So you guys remember what we talked about that helps to get rid of clots once they've formed? Fibrinolytics. Do you remember what the actual product our body produces is? So TPA is a component of that. It's a tissue plasminogen activator, which turns plasminogen into... Plasmin, yeah, so plasma is the really important thing there. We need plasma to help to get rid of that, but certainly TPA is a good uh, enzyme to help kick that off. All right, so that's uh, that's really important to make sure we have a good balance there. And so, again, we already kind of uh, feel like we kind of jumped the, the gun a little bit talking about the fiber analytics working at this point, but that's okay. Um, so we'll talk about antiplatelets and then the anticoagulants, kind of how they're working on different aspects of the system. So, again, typically what you're going to find um, is that when you have uh, initial injury to the the, the the vessel, you're gonna have initial vasospasm. A lot of that can be mediated through things like thromboxane. Um, you're gonna develop that platelet plug, as we kind of talked about before, uh, do things like von Willebrand's factor and, and, and tissue factor and whatnot. And then you get that fibrin clot, and then finally plasma comes along and, and lyses that. So, covered that already. And again, lots of different factors are gonna be here. We're gonna look at our coagulation cascade again. Um, we'll look at some of the factors that are gonna be affecting uh, um, uh, platelets. So you guys remember some things that uh, activate platelets? We're going to look at that again in more detail. Fantastic. To remind you guys. Anyway, so again, normally that endothelial surface is pretty smooth, right? It's sort of trying to prevent clots from normally happening in the most part, uh, for the most part. Um, but what you can find is that uh, you have natural anticoagulants as well, which is this is important. You have these. So you have things like thrombomodulin on the surface of cells helps prevent clots from forming. Um, you have things like protein C, which is formed in the liver that actually inactivates some of our clotting factors like five, factor eight, things like that. And then we have the antithrombin three, right? This is going to be super, super important when we get to talking about things like heparin. You know, heparin's a natural anticoagulant, but it helps to work with antithrombin three by binding up and, and activating several uh, clotting factors, okay? They mentioned that heparin is useful because it actually helps to bind to antithrombin-3 and makes it work better. So it actually increases the activity pretty uh, pretty significantly there. So um, you'll see there's several different things that can influence platelet activation. So we have things like prostacyclin or PGI-2. This can help to actually inhibit platelet activation, which is good because we don't want platelets activating if they don't need to be. And thromboxane A2 is actually going to be stimulating platelet activation. And you'll see things like plasma helps actually degrade um, clots that have already formed. And there's lots of other factors that are going to be out there as well. So we'll kind of talk about those uh, as they become important as far as drugs go. So we looked at clots before. So again, you know, these uh, red blood cells get mixed in there. You have your platelets and then obviously fibrin kind of holds everything together pretty, uh, pretty, um, pretty strongly. And so looking at a resting platelet, normally what you're going to find is this kind of nice, uh, has this kind of globular shape, doesn't really get activated all that too well. But once it gets exposed to things like collagen, von Willebrand's factor, you're going to start to see this conformational change. This is where we get that 2B3A receptors that are being exposed here, right? Have we talked about any of this before? Just as far as aspirin goes, right? That's okay. So anyway, you see this conformation. So you can kind of change their shape and you get these little kind of legs that are sticking off of them. But you have these two B3A receptors here. And this is what's actually going to allow for things like fibrinogen to actually help to stick platelets together. So you can see how they start to kind of aggregate together. And by affecting different sites on the platelet, you can actually help to prevent them from uh, aggregating together uh, quite so much. So um, again, Platelet activation, usually after being exposed to that collagen, you're going to find that von Willebrand factor is going to bind to that these uh, glycoprotein 1A um, uh, sites. And then you're also going to find that thromboxane A2, we mentioned, is going to help to activate platelets and then ADP. And this is a similar adenosine diphosphate we've seen kind of elsewhere in the body as well. Um, so we're going to have drugs that can effectively, uh, uh, specifically affect this site. We're going to have things that are going to affect thromboxane. We're going to find um, that also we're going to have drugs that affect this 2B3A receptors as well. Okay, so these are all going to be potential sites. By blocking these, we can help to prevent the platelets from activating. So mentioned fibrinogen helps to form those kind of those linkages, uh, linkages between the different platelets to have them kind of stick together. Uh, and there's also going to be a couple... Um, other things here were these like kind of PAR1 and PAR4 receptors as well we'll talk about later. And then ADP is going to be uh, affecting these P2Y1 and P2Y12 receptors. That's where we're going to see things like uh, Plavix. We're actually going to be able to prevent um, uh, platelet aggregation by, by blocking those receptor sites. So here's a platelet. 
here are all the things that are going to have either positive or negative effects on causing it to either aggregate or to prevent aggregation. Obviously, here we have that 2B3 receptors, and this is where fibrinogen is helping them kind of link together and help to form that kind of platelet plug that it forms there kind of early in that vascular injury. So also we're going to have things like aspirin. Uh, this is going to help to block uh, production of things like thromboxane A2 because that gets produced as part of what pathway? What enzyme that's preventing or inhibiting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, again, aspirin works through blocking COX, all right? So blocking cycle oxygenase um, and by preventing formation of thromboxane, uh, this is how it's going to be very useful for helping to block platelet aggregation in the first place. Here you see uh, normal platelet kind of looks before activation. You can imagine how these kind of can just start to stick together a little bit, uh, especially as those receptor sites start to get uh, exposed there. Okay. Um, Things that normally help to inhibit platelet activation, we have things like prostacyclin or PGI2. Normally that gets secreted by the endothelium and actually it helps to block the, the platelets from being activated in the first place. That's a natural inhibitory kind of factor there. Um, and again, normally collagen is not being exposed in the endothelium. Normally we have that um, uh, kind of smooth surface on there that helps prevent the collagen from being exposed there. And then typically thrombin is not going to be very well um, uh, expressed during the states where you don't need to have a clot being formed. And then again, platelets are not going to be exposed to that 2B3 receptor. They really don't form the, or show those until they they had that conformational change that occurs when like collagen and von Willebrand's factor are involved there. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is going to be aspirin because it's kind of our prototypical kind of antiplatelet drug we're going to look at. So we know that aspirin is a reversible, irreversible? Yeah. Irreversible, right? So it's going to be effective for the life of the platelet essentially. How long do platelets stick around for? It's like seven to ten days or so-ish, you know, it depends. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, red blood cells usually like 120 or, or so. Um, but your, your playlist is stick around for less time than that. You just have to 10 days. So, again, as long as the aspirin is around, it's an effect of that COX enzyme, it's going to be inactive for the, the life of that platelet, essentially. So that's why we always take like 81 milligrams a day to prevent platelet clots from forming by, uh, by kind of constantly keeping new platelets being inactivated as they get formed, essentially. Um, so, again, we're working primarily on blocking the effects of thromboxane E2. That's the primary thing we're trying to prevent production of because, again, Cycloxygenase is going to change that arachidonic acid into several things like prostaglandin, prostacyclin, et cetera. Um, this is the big thing we're trying to uh, block here. And that's going to be through COX-1. And we said that COX-1, is that normally uh, constitutive or inducible? It's usually constitutive. That's the one that's going to be around, kind of expressed all the time. COX-2 is the one that is usually going to be um, constituent, meaning you only have it really being expressed in areas of like inflammation and things like that. This is going to be important because when we talk about um, the COX-2 inhibitors, um, how it actually cause uh, increased mortality. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and you may see you know, maximal inhibition around 160 milligrams of aspirin a day, but most people can get away with just taking 81. You see pretty similar effects from that standpoint. The problem is if you have even higher doses than that, you end up blocking PGI2 production. And we said PGI2 is normally uh, inhibitory or uh, um, stimulatory on platelets. So that was inhibitory. So if actually if you end up blocking prostacyclin formation, that can actually stimulate platelets to actually clot together. So this is why we don't like to drive our dose up too high of the aspirin. You know, 81, totally fine for, for most patients a day. Um, and again, that's where we saw that problem with if you had just something to block COX-2 only, you'd end up losing this inhibitory factor here and you kind of throw things on the side of producing too much thromboxane E2. And that's where you saw clots forming increased cardiovascular death for patients who are taking uh, specific COX-2 inhibitors. So if you've ever heard of Vioxx, that's kind of the classic example of that of a drug pulled off the market, which is causing increased death due to that. Okay, so looking at COX activation, again, this is changing that membrane phospholipids down into arachidonic acid. That's phospholipase A is the enzyme there. And then cyclooxygenase, uh, just one pathway that's going to go down. What was the other pathway we talked about in asthma? Yeah, leukotriene, right? So you have that like oxygenase, it can turn into leukotrienes. But we're focused here on cyclooxygenase, and this is where we can see things like prostacyclin, which is typically going to have more platelet um, uh, inhibitory effects, but certainly thromboxane is going to be really important for causing platelet aggregation to occur. So if you inhibit this, hopefully you inhibit platelet aggregation, hopefully keep your patient's uh, vessels patent. So I mentioned aspirin is going to be affecting both COX-1 and COX-2 uh, pretty much equally. So you don't really have an issue with the imbalance there between thromboxane and prostacyclin, essentially. Um, and then what you're going to see is that, uh, sorry, Dr. O just walked by and she distracted me. That's okay. Um, but anyway, so again, this is why you avoid COX-2 inhibitors only because we saw increased cardiovascular death due to not having enough prostacyclin around to inhibit those platelets. All right. 
NSAIDs, on the other hand, you're going to find these tend to have more of a reversible effect, right? So this is why we don't use things like ibuprofen to block uh, platelets from being activated, because again, once the drug is gone out of the system, platelets can start to work again. Their, their cycle oxygenase can, can start to function just normally. So um, again, just be aware, that's why we use aspirin for a cardioprotectant uh, agent. We don't really use ibuprofen or other types of NSAIDs, right? So a very kind of uh, limited type of effect as far from a time, uh, time frame. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go now because I think they want to get started with uh, cardio pretty soon. But any questions I can answer for you guys before I let you go. Stay safe out there. Watch out for razor blades in your apples. Uh, watch out for uh, rat feces, apparently, and Snickers. That's a, that a concern for some students, so just be careful out there. Uh, and otherwise, I'll see you guys next time.